I am recording. Got a couple more minutes. Somebody wants to sing for us or something while we're waiting. Again, remember to go into the chat box, type hi for me so that your name is showing up in the chat. Again, going into chat, typing hi for me. I'm trying to record attendance. In most Zoom meetings, I have two teachers. So one of us can do one and one can do the teaching while the other's doing the attendance check, but I do not have that luxury in this class. And again, we are on record. Please be aware that this is recorded. Yesterday, I was only to, able to make it through about half of the class as I was going down alphabetically in checking and entering grades from Edmentum into PowerSchool. I am going to work on that some more. But I do have some people who need to be more attentive inside of Edmentum because at this point I am about to enter into Canvas your assignment to take the unit test on the ancients. For those of you just joining us, please go into the chat box, type hi. I'm checking for some individual bodies at this moment. In Edmentum, you should be in there about 45 minutes a day. When you are inside of a um, tutorial where it's actually doing the teaching before you take the test. I expect 45 minutes in that tutorial and I'm giving you basically a three-day window for each tutorial before you 
are expected to take that test based on the dates that I'm using inside of PowerSchool's gradebook. Okay, I'm looking for Najee, Gerald, Vijay, Emily, Daniel, Lizbeth. Noah Skelton has been in contact with me today and I know that they're working on some technical issues there. Dustin, Sean, and Jakira. Does anyone have any way to contact those people and say, hey, we're in class? Yay, there's Jakira. All right, I am moving over to share screen. So that also means that I'm going to have more difficulty with manipulating the... Um, no. 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 No, no. Yes, we can hear you. We're not muted. All right, apparently we're wanting to be very sluggish in this as my computer is trying to open. I've had some weird experiences today, including my mouse buttons um, suddenly changing from left to right, flipping over on me right in the middle of a Zoom class. So um, a little odd. All right. So again, we are in recording mode. So if you have been working in Edmentum, <clears throat> and some of you have not, um, if you have been working in Edmentum, you should be at about the point where due on Monday is the section on ancient India and ancient China. A few of you have already passed that and actually gone into unit two Thank you very much. But um, I have some people who haven't even made it into discovering the ancient past thing. So um, you are seriously behind. Please keep in mind that next week, we are halfway through this grading period. Next week, we are halfway through this grading period. Okay? So it is incredibly important that you become much more aware of timing and of moving through things, okay? So making certain that work is getting done. For those of you who added today's keyword to your identity, thank you very much. I did receive a message that one person said they did not know how, and some people have told me that when they signed in, it did not ask for their identity. And apparently it has to do with accessing it through the website. Um, if Jackson will unmute for me and do that little spiel again about how you did that. Okay, so if you go into the Zoom app without clicking on a link, just pull up the Zoom app. There should be a settings, um, um, settings picture on the bottom left of your screen. If you click on that. Pause, pause for a second. That is before you click on the meeting itself, correct? Yes. Okay. And so once you click on the settings picture, it should pop up with a list of things you can do. If you click on your name, it'll take you to a place where you can type in the rest of your name or change your name. And then if you just click save, it'll take you back to the home screen and then you can join the Zoom with that name. Okay, and the really bad news is that different teachers are gonna be using different code words, okay? Um, I have not had an, um, an instance of Zoom bombing, but we did have an instance of it upstairs um, where someone is actually logging in as the student, using the student's name. So the teacher in looking at the waiting room cannot tell that that isn't 
example, Molly Boone, that isn't Jackson um, Atlin. So they're letting that person in and then the student um, is getting accused of what this hacker did. So, you know, just be aware. And again, different teachers will be using different code words. So um, you really do need to learn how to manipulate your profile and change your name to what that teacher is asking for, okay? So, um, and again, we will have a different code every week that we meet, okay? Because if I'm sharing this video, then obviously people are seeing um, the code word that I have chosen for today's meeting, all right? And if some hacker is out there watching our video, haha, we only meet once a week, so you can't hack into my Monday class using the pizza code word, haha. -ha. Okay. <laughs> Anyway, the things that people go to the trouble to do. All right, so again, we are talking about ancient China and ancient India. And I know that um, as a world history teacher in the past, even when I taught um, ancient history before now, um, before I became an AIG teacher, before world history from the high school level descended into the middle school um, for gifted children, we often focused on Egypt, and Mesopotamia and those poor little people over in Asia didn't get our attention. So I'm making certain that today we are talking about early civilization in China. China is designed in dynasties. Dynasties. Does everyone know what a dynasty is? Again, this should be reviewed from sixth grade. It is uh, it is when someone like rules, when a family rules over a region for a, while, a time. Yes. So it's similar to um, a house when we're talking about the house of Windsor, who currently is um, the monarchy in Great Britain. And the descendants in that particular house and one of my favorite um, eras in the um, early Renaissance is the House of Tudor, and that's the one with Henry VIII and um, Anne Boleyn, his second wife, and Queen Elizabeth I, his um, daughter um, from Anne. Okay, so um, dynasties are long periods of history of a particular family. So the change in the family, okay? All right, let me see how I can, there we go, making sure, because I've got so many things covering so many things on my computer screen. I've got to, I've got to get better at extend than what I am right now on my view. I'm not good at it. I don't like it when my mouse isn't where I want it to be. So um, what do we need to know about Chinese history and its impact on the world? First of all, I want you to understand that China has a very, very, very large economic interest in the United States. There is a lot of investment of Chinese money, Chinese businesses in America. So there's a lot of debt of the United States government that we owe to China. And truly, if they called us on that debt right now, they would own us. So it's very important that we understand the relationship of Chinese history, and it's very um, important that we understand the relationship of China and America today. Um, Daniel, you just checked in. I haven't seen you type hi in the um, chat box for attendance, if you will take care of that for me. All right, so, and, and just in case there was anybody else who joined us very recently. Um, so China has the longest unbroken history among those world um, civilizations. So those four major ancient civilizations of Mesopotamia, Egypt, India, and China 
China is the one that for 5,000 years stayed intact. They were not invaded by another culture. They were not broken by another culture, etc. Okay. Um, I'm not, still not seeing Daniel. I'm wondering if Daniel um, has sound. It's a good thing we record this so we can watch later. All right. So in our ethnic makeup of the United States, yes, we need to say hi every Friday. Um, in the ethnic makeup of the United States, if we all went and did that little blood test thing for Ancestry.com or um, one, two, three, and me, um, th those little things that analyze your DNA, um, we would, um, one in every five people, 20% of us would find makeup in our genetic code from um, Chinese descent. And that would be 4.5% of our population, keeping in mind that the United States has over 350 million people. Um, China also has a very important economic impact on the world. And China's, um, I just thought about something. Let me, let me check the schedule real quick. I gotta figure out how to turn my phone off. Because there is a person who has been calling me in the middle of um, all my lessons today. I'll take the phone off the hook maybe. <laughs> so, I'm getting tired of that phone ringing um, in the middle of my, my lessons. All right, so the economic powerhouse of China um, has been at the lead. China has been the world's largest economy during 18 of the past 20 centuries. So 20 centuries, and a century is 100 years that if we lined up 20 of them, China has been the largest economic power in 18 of them, okay? So understand the economic impact, the importance of China in world power. Okay, the geography of China, the importance of the Wangho River and the Changjiang River, okay? The Wang He is also called the River of Sorrow or the Yellow River. It is filled with the Less, L-O-E-S-S, -S, and it has to do with flooding the region. What is good about the floods of the Wang He River? Does anybody know? Doesn't it bring like a sort of silt? It does, and what's important about the, that silt? And that's S-I-L-T, in case anybody thinks I said silk. Silt. What's important about the silt in this region? Absolutely, Austin. It is very important for farming. It returns fertility. It brings fresh soil, okay? And my husband and I um, like to have our little patch of tomatoes, and we have serious issues in our garden that the ground provided. So we had to create raised boxes in order to bring in dirt because um, there's some kind of fungus or something in our soil that destroys our tomato plants and all that work for nothing. So um, now we've got those tomato boxes um, on the backside of our garage in our backyard. Um, so, you know, I don't have that new soil coming in to replenish the nutrients for my soil. So I had to buy it in bags and bring it home from Lowe's, okay? So the Changjiang River, hugely important, and the Wang He River, hugely important. And the Wang He is called the Yellow and the Changjiang is called the Yangtze. And Yangtze sometimes is spelled Y-A-N-G-T-Z-E, okay? Keeping in mind that when a foreign language turns into English that we're just trying to imitate sounds using our letter combinations in order to do so. And um, we don't always do well with that. So again, the review of 
the annual floods, bringing the rich soil into the floodplain. So while it is terrible to endure a flood, it is necessary in their region for their dependence on farming. The less, L-O-E-S-S, -S, is the name of that fine dusty soil. It is often also carried in the wind, so it actually gives a yellow cast to um, If you're asking about the code name, um, Caleb, it was sent in an email, okay? Um, and the announcement in Canvas only told you to check your email. I did not send it in Canvas intentionally, okay? All right, so um, the other nickname for the Wangho River is the River of Sorrows. Okay, um, the picture on the left is not a stack of sliced meat that looks very similar to going to the deli department in the grocery store. That is not what that is at all. That is terraced farming where they purposely have created steps in the terrain in order to reduce the runoff that would take seeds right out of the ground, for example. Um, the rainfall is plentiful in the southern region of China, which is important for growing rice. That is one reason that they have so much rice in their diet. Um, I remember, and you're probably a little too young unless you've seen it in reruns, there's a show called Every, Everybody Loves Raymond. My husband loved that show. And at one point, um, he asks um, his wife something about what's for supper, and she said something about rice, and he says, we just had rice um, last night. Who eats rice two nights in a row? Well, how about one billion Chinese people? So um, that was the joke. But anyway, um, in northern China, they have a cooler and drier climate, so they have less rainfall, and it's suitable for grains such as wheat and millet. Um, corn is also considered a grain, just so that you have in your head what we mean by grains. Things that people would make cereal out of would be considered grains. The area also is um, relatively isolated. They are surrounded by things that protect them. So um, to the south and west, they are surrounded um, on that border by the Himalayan mountains. And that is certainly going to dissuade, deter people from invading from the south. Um, the um, Mount Everest is in Nepal, which is um, just to the southwest on that Chinese border. There's also that huge desert called the Gobi Desert to the north. Mongolia is sitting in that Gobi Desert. And then jungle to the southeast. So what geographic features allowed early China to develop without being tainted by invasions from other cultures, and that has to do with the um, rivers, the mountains, the jungle, the desert, okay, um, their ability to produce enough food to support their culture, um, allowed for the development of civilization, people to settle. We talked about the importance of agriculture before, and why was it called the Middle Kingdom? And that has to do with geography more than it does with the timeline because they were surrounded. They saw themselves as the middle. And um, if you remember my discussion of the ancient Greeks, that their understanding of geography was very small. They didn't travel very far. So they thought the world was very small. The Chinese, early Chinese were very similar. They thought the world was very small because of the geographic barriers that kept them from getting out and from others getting in. The Shang Dynasty from 1600 to 1122 BC. China was ruled by a strong monarchy. So we would recognize that as a king or a queen. Um, loyal clan leaders acted as the king's governors and ruled distant parts of the kingdom. This would be similar to the feudal system that we might recognize 
of um, the kings and the lords of the manor and the vassals and that structural system um, that allows you to send friends of yours out into the distance in order to govern on your behalf. The king also had a powerful army preventing rebellions so people did not fight against the established government and they also fought out, um, outside opponents because you know the existence of the, um, the Great Wall of China was there for a reason because the Mongol hordes tried to invade multiple times. Most people in the Shang Dynasty period were peasants. They lived basically subsistence farming. They only produced enough to feed themselves and their families. Religiously, they worshiped their ancestors in this time period. They would have a shrine inside their home in which they set up like a little closet in the house or a little cabinet, often with candles and things that they would um, focus on the memories of the people who had um, passed on, people who had already died. And they believed that the steam that they would offer from their in burning incense or um, scented spices that they would burn, they believed that that steam actually fed the spirits of the ancestors, which is not unlike the ancient Greeks believing that their burning sacrifices fed the gods. Um, they believe that the universe is balanced between yin and yang, and you've probably seen that symbol before somewhere. Um, that is the um, often black and white, but we're using a pink background here, so that left side looks pink. But um, it's a balance between earth and heaven. And the, they also saw earth versus heaven, earth being female and heaven being male. And that doesn't mean in any way that they believe that only males go to heaven. It just has to do with the equal balance of forces, darkness and light, things that are opposites in that way. As part of their worship, they asked ancestors for advice through the use of oracle bones. So they would use bits of animal bones or turtle shells and a living person asked a question of the dead ancestor. And then a hot piece of metal was applied to that animal bone and it would create cracks. And then they would read the cracks Maybe you've heard of people who claim to be able to read tea leaves. You know, you'll um, mix loose tea into um, a pot of water. And when the water is drained, the pattern that the tea leaves make on the bottom of the pot, there are people who claim that that sends messages. Um, the ancient Greeks believed that, you know, the patterns of the way birds flew in the sky gave us messages from the gods, etc. Chinese writing is done through a system of characters. Um, in some, we even call it calligraphy. Um, modern use of the term calligraphy, though, has more to do with just really fancy writing the way that you might address a wedding invitation. But um, it is a pictorial language where there are pictures representing um, words. So you can see man you can see how close that looks like a person standing, okay? And then the fish, you see that shape there, okay? And I wish I could zoom a little more. I can a little more, but I'm gonna have to come back down. So again, you see the man. Ear, look how much it looks like an ear, a fish. I don't see how that looks anything like the sun personally, but the moon, a little bit more than the sun, I think, okay? But um, using pictorial script in order to record thoughts through pictures, and then those pictures develop more into what you and I would recognize as letters, but their letters, of course, look entirely different. Also keeping in mind that um, the Chinese write vertically instead of horizontally. 
they have thousands of characters, thousands of characters. You know, we, we have just sent um, a whole new group of kindergartners into school and one of the things that they're expected to master is the letters of the alphabet and not only knowing what they are, but in what order they should be recited. I remember um, a friend of mine actually said that her son knew all of his letters. He just didn't know what order they were supposed to be in. And, but um, imagine growing up Chinese because they're not actually using letters. It's more of concepts. Sometimes it's a combination of concepts like they would use the fish and the man together to represent a fisherman but um, imagine having to learn 5,000 to 10,000 just to read a daily newspaper. Much more complicated than English. Tones. They often have. Jeremiah, you might need to mute. We got some background. Thank you. So um, I'm not going to try to imitate these sounds at all but the actual speech of Chinese, they have four different tones in the way they speak. Uh, my nephew went to China and learned for an entire semester and he had to sign a contract that he would only speak Chinese the entire time he was there. He was allowed to type in English back to his parents in an email, but if he was speaking even to a classmate from the United States, he had to use Chinese the entire time he was there. He was very close to getting a second major in Chinese. I don't know why he changed his mind in his last semester and he started taking other languages instead of finishing that one degree, but okay. But um, I have had him record a message for me before, but um, I lost that a long, long time ago, okay? All right, so did I just get one? Okay, felt like it. All right, the Shang achievements and decline, the Shang dynasty and um, the Shang religion led to great advances in working with bronze. Um, bronze is um, harder than gold or silver, which are, tend to be a little bit softer and a little bit more easily damaged because that bronze is an alloy. Um, they built high, they created highly decorative bronze vessels, objects created for religious rituals, they also built huge structures like to tombs and they created a calendar and a money system during the Shang Dynasty. The end of the dynasty um, came when armies, armies from a nearby tribe, the Zhu, invaded and established a new dynasty, just like a monarchy. You know, back in the old days, in the Middle Ages, for example, if a um, particular um, king was killed, then a new family became um, leader if he was killed in battle as a result of war, not simply you know, dying of something. Um, the Zhu dynasty followed the Shang dynasty, 1027 to 256 BC. Again, we're talking before common era. When the Zhu conquered the Shang, leaders worried about Chinese people not accepting them, and they introduced the concept of mandate of heaven mandate of heaven. Um, has anybody ever heard the term divine right? I'll type it into the chat. Divine right was a European concept that said what? Does anybody know? Somebody, anybody? I'm not making it to India at this rate. Come on, come on. Divine right meant that kings and we, and yes, kings and queens were chosen by God and they were put on the throne by God. And who are you to question God? So we must stay in power. So mandate of heaven is the exact same thing, just the Asian form of the same concept. Okay. So um, the people should support a ruler because God chose that ruler and God would not put anyone in power who should not be. Um, I don't think that that's a valid concept anymore, but certainly during the age of enlightenment of the 1700s, 
um, that was questioned very seriously, um, even back into the um, Magna Carta um, early, early um, in the um, Middle Ages. So the dynastic cycle, the Zhu said that the Shang were overthrown because they lost God's favor. And keep in mind that when they say God, they do not mean the Christian God. Later rulers used the mandate of heaven to explain the dynastic cycle. So the rotation of leaders and the rise and fall of um, different dynasties over time is called the dynastic cycle. And um, religiously, because of the mandate of heaven, um, the people believed that if a dynasty fell from power, it was because they had become corrupt and no longer had the support of the gods. So again, you've got that rotation of the dynastic cycle, and I'm going to share this with you, so I'm not going to read that word for word because I'm looking at the time. Okay, during the Zhu dynasty, they learned to use iron, and iron, um, you know, even we talk about the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, when we talk about the developments of man over time, if, if you study anthropology and the progression of technology, and keep in mind, we do not necessarily mean electronic things that get plugged in. Um, we simply mean the use of tools to complete tasks. So um, iron was stronger, could be made less expensively, and it also was produced more quickly than bronze, and it also strengthened the Zhu army. So then they found out about weapons like the catapult and cavalry, which is horse-mounted army. The Chinese learned to make silk during the Zhu dynasty, and that, of course, became the most valuable export. Everybody does know where silk actually comes from, right? Anybody? Anybody? Has anybody ever heard of a silk worm? It really is a worm. And just like spiders who generate silk to make a spider web, these silkworms are actually producing these filaments that are then woven into silk. The first books of China come from the Zhao period. Um, they were written on strips of bamboo or wood that were tied together. The population grew during this time period. Farmers le learned new techniques. They increased the production of their harvest. They created food surplus. And remember, we talked about the importance of surplus before. I hope you remember the importance of surplus. Please write this down if, if you do not already know. Surplus means that we have more than we need. So we are not living just for the moment of what we can produce. It means that we can save, we can store, we can trade, and that we would be able to specialize and develop other skills. Uh, roads, canals allowed better transportation and communication, and they introduced the use of coins and the use of chopsticks. And I actually know how to use chopsticks, but I learned from a Japanese descendant, not from a Chinese descendant. The Warring States period was from 403 to 221 BC, where a number of small states fought each other over land and power, and the Zhu was still nominally in charge. Nominally means in name only. So they really didn't have power over the region. They were just the ones who lived in the palace kind of thing. And then the Qin, that is pronounced Qin, just like below your mouth, the Qin, dynasty arose, bringing an end to the Warring States period, and they replaced the Zhu dynasty. Okay, how did China change under the Zhu? The development of iron technology, the population growth, the new farming techniques, surplus of food, the growth of cities, the development of roads and canals, or better communication and transportation, and coins and chopsticks. All right, and I, wow, have six whole minutes to talk about India, wow. 
All right. Um, India actually fascinates me because, you know, when I was a child, I visited my grandparents living up in the mountains of North Carolina, my mother's parents, and they had an outhouse still. They did not get an inside bathroom until I was about six years old. And yet the ancient Indians, as in of India, ancient India had working sewer systems. So how is it that these people thousands of years ago had working sewer systems and my grandparents in the early 70s had an outhouse? I don't know. All right, so India is considered a subcontinent. It is believed that in the movement of tectonic plates that India actually slid northward and jammed into the Asian continent and that created the ridge known as the Himalayan mountains. So as you see here, this major river, this Indus River system here, this is the Indus River, and look at the development of all of these village sites along the way. And then this is the Ganges River, the Ganges River. Again, the importance of river in the development of civilization, the importance of fresh water, drinking water, water for your crops, etc. So the Mahenjo-daro actually had a citadel, which is a, um, the word just flew out of my head. Um, fortified, that's the word I want. The fortified city where they had walls of stone to protect themselves and the city was inside. That's what a citadel is, not just um, a military university in South Carolina. This is an aerial view. So if we were looking down on Mahenjo-daro's um, remains, the ruins from a satellite. This is looking at it from the side so you can get a perspective of height. This would be the steps. So that gives you a good scale view of climbing the steps. The Great Bath, again, they had um, running water, they had aqueducts, they had drainage for their water, sewage systems, a well to collect fresh water from the rain. Look at how narrow the street would be. The granary where they stored food that had been grown, storing crops, pottery of the time period, the development of ancient art, early letters. Again, I will be happy to share this with you. No one at, to date has been able to decipher this language. So maybe one of you will become a wonderful anthropologist and figure out the pattern of letters and put meaning to them. Sculpture. Jewelry, again, another water collection site. Drain has to do with that outflow of water into their sewer system. They call this the unicorn seal. Harappa was the other um, village, if you looked at that um, map with the um, Indus River Valley, Harappa was the other one. Um, but is that really a rhinoceros? I don't know. That's a bull, not a butt, okay? Bull. Doesn't look much like an um, elephant to me. Burial pottery. A male skeleton well-preserved because of being buried. Female skeleton, here's the child. And then we go to the Vedic age, the Aryan migration. And Aryan today, we often associate that with a term that Hitler would have used, but that is not the term that we're using here. Um, but I am looking at the clock and it is time for me to stop sharing. 
be reminded that you have a project due on Monday. Your locker culture project is due on Monday. I have had one person who has already submitted that to me. Thank you very much. Um, anyone else with questions, concerns? Keeping in mind that progress in Edmentum, again, you should be closing out in unit one at this point and finishing the ancients, okay? The ancients being those four civilizations of Mesopotamia, Egypt, um, India, and China. No questions? All right, I am still going through Edmentum. I did find something yesterday in a different report that I have not seen before. And that is the ones that are um, giving you the exempt um, emblem. And um, that is because you did well on the pretest enough on that segment that you do not have to um, complete that section. So I will be going back in thrills my soul that I have to open every single report again and looking for those fancy little loopy looking E's for people. All right. I'm telling y'all, y'all just don't know how much overwhelming. I went home last night and cried, but it's, and it's not just your class. It's just all of them. <laughs> all right. Okay. Have a good weekend, be productive, be responsible, time management, get focused on getting things done, all right? Good to see you, thank you for joining me, bye.